a lot of people, like you watch interviews for like movies or TV and it's the same Batman. six questions over and over again. What was it like working with this person? Yes. Uh, I can pretty much guarantee some of the questions here you will have never been asked in an interview before. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and, they ask those questions in a very safe bumpers up corporate control to spin the message that they want for the, the thing they're trying to sell. <laughs> I know. Imagine, imagine being the recipient of that, like on those press <laughs> tours, just insanity. <laughs> I read a story. I can't remember which actor it was that did this, but what they would do is they would give like a different, like a radically different answer every <laughs> single time they did an interview. So That's they'd be great. asked the same question like three times across three different media presses and just give a different one. That's um, hilarious. So I, I always thought like, well, if you have the time, if someone's given you their time, like yeah. surely they might be contractually obligated to do so, but you should really kind of make it fun and make it worth it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't give a shit about like fame because like m most of the time fame kind of just ruins people's lives. That's yeah. what I yeah. Like yeah. most people that are famous are miserable. Uh, they hate that fact. Yeah. They like the money that comes with that, but they hate the fact that everyone stares at them all the time. So I'm mm -hmm. not doing that to be like well known or or whatever. I'm doing that to like meet people like yourself and like mm. connect and have fun and just make cool. a thing that I'm proud of. That's um, great. These questions uh, range from like serious to silly. You can take mm -hmm. as much time as you want to answer them. Um, great. And yeah, other than that, do you have any questions for me? Uh, no, I mean, I guess my, I'm just curious. I'm fascinated that any, uh, you know, everyone lives in their respective bubble of their own head and stuff. And I forget that, I'm a public figure to a degree. I always, I mean, my, my relationship with being a public figure is that I, I am my own business and I forget that that, you know what I mean? Like, I've, and so I'm just like, so did you get to know me through the podcast or from, from other stuff? So you're, the way I found you is very interesting because do you ever have someone just recur in the media you watch just over and over again, the space of like yeah. three or four weeks? <laughs> Yeah, you are that person. <clears throat> I like funny. saw you everywhere, and I was like, uh, <laughs> oh. I was watching College Humor. There you right. were. I was watching an episode of Veep. Oh, there you were in the background. Right. I was um, talking to a friend of mine about like my. So I don't call mine a podcast, right? Mm. This is the thing. I call it an internet radio show, um, because the the thing that inspired me to do this was yeah. a show called A Life Well Wasted, which was always pitched as an internet radio show about video games and the people who love them. And right. I was like, that's such a cool term. I also mm -hmm. not quite like the fact that Apple kind of monetizes pod podcast. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Um, but then I was talking to my friend about internet radio and like what they were listening to. And they're like, oh, there's this show where a dude talks to people about like creativity and being bald and what that means. And I was like, mm. what? what? <laughs> <laughs> Say what? <laughs> Excuse me? Um, and then I was like, it's that fucking guy again. That's really uh, funny. And so I was like, oh, well, I have to talk to you now. Like, oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. I love it. The, the, I previewed one of your episodes. And it was Todd Stashwick, who I know from uh, back in New York when I was starting out and just getting into improv. And he was part of this, this pretty, like, a little bit more uh, eclectic arts arts focus sort of improv approach you know it was almost sort of like they're doing stage plays and, and and stuff um so yeah i did that was that was really cool it was like oh man i love i loved the little cross-pollination that happens of just or you know just recurrent sort of like concentric circles that people sort of like oh man this guy knows this guy this connected to that that's from my past like so i love yeah that. like um todd stashwick knows everyone like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how he is connected yeah. to every single person. I don't know how. He's so nice. He's such yeah. a nice guy. Um, I'm very grateful that every single person I've had on the show like, has been so kind and welcoming and warm to me. Um, yeah. And so it's I, just, I, I mean, from my perspective, like, you're just you reaching out and uh, just the premise of it, it you know, it, 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 it it is an inviting kind of like conceit which is like oh yeah that's a conversation that that sounds like a, a good back and forth as opposed to hey we have an agenda will you help fill our agenda and then you can get your agenda out so that's good uh also just speaking of the conversation thing uh, mm -hmm. 
if you are interested in my answers to any of these, you're like, that's a stupid question. I want to hear your answer. <laughs> um, please go ahead. Some people okay, do, some cool. people don't. You have, there's no pressure on it. But yeah. I find that people who do like internet radio shows tend to like to like interview me as opposed to me interviewing them. Yeah, yeah. So I like, I'm like, that's fine. We can have a conversation. Cool. That's totally fine. Gotcha. Um, with that in mind, do you want to just kick it off? Yeah. yeah. I mean, sounds. I, mean, I think we've been kicking it off for a while, but let's keep kicking it. Who are you? Oh, wow. I mean, metaphysically, spiritually, so many different things. Uh, I am Brian Husky. I am, my work is I'm an actor and sometimes writer, uh, improviser. I'll throw in creator there. Um, I'm also a father to a 14 year old uh, girl. Uh, I am currently in love with someone. So I am a loving partner. Um, I'm a, uh, a person from the Southern States of North Carolina of, of the United States, specifically North Carolina. Um, but I'm also sort of, uh, the recipient of, uh, the benefits of living in New York and Los Angeles. Um, and that's that, that's it. I'm a human being too. Oh, wow. I was unsure yeah. about that one. Thank you for clarifying. I yeah. just recently got the, you know, the 23 and me verification that yes, oh. yes, I am human. You are alive. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question two is what are the three things you value most in life? Mm. Wow. I wonder if I think that that probably changes and evolves. If you had asked me that question, 10 years ago, it would have been different. 10 years before that, I don't think I would have been able to answer it. Uh, definitely in my 30s, no idea. Um, the things, because I, I think previously, and as I get older, I'm, I'm softening and more accepting of, of a lot of kind of lessons that are like the simplicity of them uh, and the universality of them. Uh, I used to sort of have a, that was a snob about it. You know what I mean? But it really is... I value kindness, uh, empathy, and open-heartedness. I know, and I say those things because I value them because I'm genuinely working on those things and trying to create a practice around extending them, receiving them, expressing them, and I'm not great at it. I will say, like, I think, it, as I mentioned, I'm a human. A lot of times my own shit gets in the way. My own kind of like past conditionings. Um, I mean, and outside forces too, you know, it's, I, I feel like what we've all been through the past couple of years and here in the United States, prior to that with Trump and just where we are politically and this shift that's happening, I'd say globally too. I mean, I feel like fascism is really popular and kind of hot right now um it's like if we don't if that's not part of our value system uh it can it can really get sort of like buried inside of each person because everybody has the capacity to it but it's like fear fear and anxiety can really get in the way of it so when, when uh, you say open heartedness, that's kind of the one that's like we're knocking around in my head. Because mm. when I gave that answer, I, I gave kindness, I gave empathy. Mm -hmm. um, but open heartedness is like, can you give me like an example of that? Like, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, right? I'm it's a difficult one because it's, I mean, I don't think there's like a, a textbook definition to it. But I think for me, open heartedness is a willingness, which probably open heartedness will lead to kindness and empathy, I think. So maybe open heartedness is a willingness to, to be vulnerable, you know, no matter what the sort of reaction might be, uh, to be, um, non-judgmental you know because a lot of judgment for judging someone else it's based on a sort of like 
set of rules or, or uh, attitudes that you have and you're asking the other person to fit into that for, for your own comfort. And so it's sort of is accepting that your comfort, for me at least, my comfort can shift moment to moment as I adjust to the moment. But when I don't do that, I, I, you know, I'm trying to sort of like wrestle reality into some, something I need. Um, what do you think it is? Like, what is your relationship to it? Open heartedness. Like I, it is one that like, I've not really heard. Like, I suppose it is like a willingness to be wrong Mm -hmm. because that's one of the things that I work on constantly in myself is like, no, sometimes you need to like buck up and admit that you're human and fallible. And like, right. you get to admit that sometimes you make an emotional judgment that's incorrect or right. you hurt somebody and you're like, okay, but also it's a willingness to accept when like you're right or when the situation is right or to give yourself something like mm-hmm. an opportunity to be like, oh, I'm really nervous about this. Yeah. Do it. Like, you mm-hmm. And open heartedness is maybe like an acceptingness of uh, of like the whims of reality, I guess, whether that's yeah. emotional or spiritual or like just circumstantial. Yeah. Um. I think I think that's what how I would define it. And I I instantiate that in my life, but I never had like a a version of it. like I never had a word to describe mm-hmm. that before. Because I heard the term, but I never put any thought into it. Yeah. I mean, it's it. It's kind of, you know, as people sort of uh, take issue, not take issue, but, you know, mindfulness is increasingly becoming sort of a co-opted catchphrase or not catchphrase, but sort of catch-all um, term that is still up for interpretation as to how you apply it. But so I think it's the same thing. It's like you, you, what you just said had had elements of what I said of like, you know, for me, it's like if I'm trying to control the situation or the other person to fit into what I'm comfortable with, then I'm not allowing my own growth um, and discovery. And so that's kind of like if I open up my heart to that and I mean, change it to open, maybe it starts with open mindedness and then that allows you to kind of soften a little bit and be like, Oh, okay. I, I get it. But I think maybe the, maybe the, a bigger part of it for me is just that. And it's something I was like really struggling with and still struggle with. I don't know how it is in Ireland, but like just around vaccines and taking care of, you know, collectively us helping us survive a pandemic. Uh, I have I have to kind of keep returning to recognizing in others a response that I might I could easily have you know coming from a place of fear or distrust or um, past violation that uh, puts up defenses and stuff because um, if I if I can't if I can't recognize something in somebody else um, then I'm just asking the world to been to my will or for my perspective and historically that doesn't pay off you know no it doesn't it usually yeah. is like a brick wall and it's not gonna melt if you run into it right uh, and it's gonna just hurt yeah um, yeah and the crazy thing is here and i mean I, I not you know capitalism itself just sort of the backbone of our 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 country uh that and racism um uh i just preaches this that true success or victory is bending others bending to your will so you can benefit um and i am i think there's a lot of evidence that that is pretty toxic yeah <laughs> you know one of the things i've noticed while i've been in the u.s is the amount of like ads everywhere like advertisements everywhere oh yeah yeah oh god it is yeah. sickening i'm like the visual pollution here is something else. I know, right? I, I, it, it almost like makes me feel uncomfortable because I feel like I'm being watched by these inanimate things. <laughs> being like, come into me, go here. I'm like, yeah. yeah, like we have billboards and we have ads at home, like, yeah. But like, that's not the same thing as like, 
driving down a highway like get an uber looking out the window and there's like 16 ads for different pharmaceutical things i'm like yeah what the hell like we don't advertise drugs in ireland first of all right um, but second of all like if you're driving along a highway most of the time the only thing you're going to see advertised are like buildings that are at the side of that highway you're mm-hmm. not going to see like an ad for how jesus is going to save you <laughs> i'm not sure how billboards get that message across because surely yeah. surely it would be like if jesus works via billboard why do you need to go to church that, that was like right. the, like uh, and i come from a like a place where visual pollution it, it mm-hmm. like i studied art history and like just regular history and like architecture and all that stuff in yeah. college when it came to studying like ancient rome and stuff and it's just like it almost feels like an affront i'm like no yeah. there's a building behind that you don't like ruin the skyline before, yeah before i came to uh wisconsin where i am now i went to new york right and i'm like the skyline here is incredible but the streets themselves are like polluted with ads i had when i when i first moved to new york from north carolina uh, the first year probably i had like really severe back ache neck ache um like sort of head tension and all this kind of stuff and i finally i can't remember i just talked went to like a a doctor and he was like so you're are you from here i was like no i was like and he was like i really i think maybe you might be experienced sort of like overstimulation and it was true and he was like i think you come from an area where your eye line is more open and if you're what you're seeing is probably more green or just domestic and here it was true like and and i couldn't quite put a, a, a i couldn't define it at the time but i i was also having this sense of just like i am overwhelmed by humanity and all i and what i realized is like i was just constantly being reminded of human endeavor human achievement human you know consumerism it was just it was it was uh, as much sort of like a visual um, pollution that was happening as a message pollution that was happening, um, and so I I completely I agree with you being a visitor to our 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 uh, advertised well advertised nation. <laughs> it's it's insane. Tell me a memory that shaped you. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see. <laughs> A memory that shaped me. I give a first answer and then maybe it'll lead to an actual memory. Because this was not, this was more of a moment than a memory. Um, And I think it was a moment where I was allowing myself to kind of give in to what was happening and be like, oh my God. But I went to go see the Flaming Lips in uh, Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And, you know, they have this incredible visually uh, like celebratory stage show. And it's really insane. And they started off as, as this little psychedelic punk band in Oklahoma. And, the, and, and you know, the main guy, Wayne Coyne, worked at the, the local sort of like Long John Silver for 20 years while he did a band um, and he enjoyed working there as like the dishwasher while he still sort of had this band that was getting more and more popular. But my, my moment of revelation was these guys have given themselves total permission. They've just given themselves total permission. They're doing this insane band. They keep changing the way the band is. They keep sort of like upping the ante of what the, band can do what it can uh, uh you know what they're feeling and how they're going to express it through their music and for me at the time i was i'd been doing improv in new york and performing for a while but it just sort of extended this this self-permission that i need to give myself because it took me a really long time to to come around to do comedy which is what i'd always wanted to do um so I think for me that was a that was a moment um, that was really pivotal 
for for me just to be like okay i gotta let a lot go and jump in you know without sort of like questioning or flinching or judging or any of that kind of stuff um and then this is such a i mean i'm only gonna say this because the memory of it is so simple and means so little to anyone else except for me but i I lately have been like, I, those are the things that like, whether we clock them or not, I think cumulatively really help us. But it was this moment I was in the bathroom with my daughter. We were doing our evening, brushing our teeth and stuff. She was maybe four and she looked up at me and like just looked in my eyes and smiled and a bunch of toothpaste sort of like seeped out of her mouth and she just looked really happy and I felt so happy and then we just kept going but it was like one of those like kunk, you know just just trailer moments for the movie kind of thing you know what I mean uh that I was just like oh god this is and so that kind of if I'm if in my mentioning that I think that goes back to like an open-heartedness you know, like I was just engaged with my daughter, you know, in a really great way. And I will say my, my, my wife at the time and I, you know, as we split up when she was around five. So she and her mother and I were kind of like heading down a road where we were not doing well. And as that happened, I felt less engaged with my daughter, uh, like my engagement with her became more about kind of a worry of because I'm a child of divorce too and I was like oh no it's happening again you know so I was really grateful I'm I am really grateful for any of those moments where I'm like oh there it is there's yeah. there's a there's a little one and put in my pocket so that that's a good question I like that so sweet oh that thank you. yeah so sweet like the it is the minutia of our lives that builds towards the mosaic of our happiness. Yes. That, and it is so nice to just hear like a little thread from that tapestry. It's, it's yeah. beautiful. Thank you oh, so much. Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks for this. a good question. What did, can I, so I know you gave permission for this, but like, do you have, is there, is there I, a memory? I do. Yeah. So I tell this memory a lot, but I'll give you two because you okay. gave me two. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll give the one that I've said on the show before, which is that when I was 16 years old, I had a realization that I didn't remember the last time that I told my mom that I loved her. Mm. And I was like, holy fuck. And like, my mom wasn't like, sick or dying or anything like that. And my mom was still right. around. But I made that realization that, oh, I have this capacity for love. But for the past, like, couple of years, I've been angry and bitter and, like, that was kind of the start of me realizing like my gender identity and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I became through personal circumstances, well, just a very bitter and angry person. And that light bulb moment, I'm like, Oh no, like I'm not going to remember being miserable. I'm going to remember telling my mom that I love her. Right. And from that point onwards, I made a point like my family isn't necessarily a, a professing of family. But I mm -hmm. made a point to, to every now and again say, Mom, I love you. Dad, I love you. Here's a hug. Just know that I appreciate you. And I yeah. brought that into my friendships and my relationships and just the people I meet. Like if a person impacts me emotionally, I almost have a duty to myself, but also to others to say, no, that that affected me. You just made a positive impact in my mm -hmm. life. Um, so yeah that's that's a huge moment for me like it was like dominoes just yeah knocking through at the table and forming like I, I saw myself and what i had kind of become through my experience and gone, i don't like this i mm -hmm. hate this yeah yeah um the other moment i'll, I'll give is i <laughs> so uh, when i was in college i started doing dungeons and dragons i play lots <laughs> and lots of dungeons and dragons Right. And the first time that I made my players at the table laugh because of a character that I made uh -huh. was like, because I had done like acting when I was in uh, high school 
and it was i was given a character which kind of didn't suit me right and it made me feel like oh i can't do this i can't make yeah. people laugh right um and then this happened and i can remember it because the character was just just very basic very boring they didn't <laughs> do anything but like they they i said something and they all just exploded with laughter and i remember going i'm funny like <laughs> I, I i can do this yeah yeah and it, it kind of reignited that passion for me of like oh i want to tell stories and i want to like talk to people and, and i want to mm-hmm. like i don't consider myself like a social person but everyone that i know is like you are insanely social what are you talking about <laughs> uh so that was a really big thing for me which is like oh i i can be um i can be funny more specifically right. than creative because i have other things that made me go i can be creative but like funny in particular mm-hmm. that is the moment where i remember going i'm good at this yeah I'm creative yeah Oh, that's great. That is one it make that makes me think of, you know, some a lot of times it, for younger people, you know, you kind of like for me, it's like it's communicating maybe to my daughter of like, just do it. Like, don't worry about what people's response is. But at the same time, like I have like I am I do comedy because I love the feeling I of making people laugh and then realizing early on is like, Oh yeah, I'm good. I, I can do this. Um, and sometimes I've been like, I wish, I wish there wasn't a validation uh, transaction needed for a lot of creative stuff, but it's, it's just true. You know what I mean? Like, and I think, I, and I've, I think I talked about this on the, my podcast ball talk a few times but i I bring it up a lot because i i also have a huge affinity for um uh self-taught artists outsider artists you know these kind of people who will just make you know like wooden horses out of like blocks of wood that they find at lumber yards or something for their every day for the you know the rest of their life they paint them crazy colors or whatever and they're just doing it because they have a, a compulsion or they have a it it just feeds their soul and then eventually somebody is like this is really amazing like what you're doing um i just love i love that because i think it's sort of the flip maybe that's a message i'm giving myself of just like it's also okay just like to to remember like if it gives you joy then that's that a lot of times enough that's, that's enough it, to yeah. pursue it yeah um do you know who avery monson is Mm-mm. avery monson uh he actually operates in the same circles as you like mm-hmm. he's worked with college team in the past he's like knows a lot of people and you know avery monson is the most eccentric manic creative like kind yeah. man um ever during the pandemic he in his gar- uh, garage or garage whatever right uh, he made a using like puppetry and strings and magic made a, a children's show for people to oh. watch with their kids. Oh, cool! Um, um, he carves stuff uh, on his Instagram. He learned how to like make paintings using graphing software. Um, oh, wow! He writes children's books. Like he yeah. is a, an interesting dude. Uh, yeah. And I think based on that, you should you should just like. Go on Instagram and just look at his Instagram and be like, "Okay, I'll do that." Make, he made vines for a long time, mm-hmm. as well. Um, yeah. Even though, like, the people that were on Vine were between the age of like you know sixteen to twenty-one, as TikTok is kind of today, and mm-hmm. he was like uh, late twenties, early thirties, and he was just making these, and they were all like puppetry, and it is ins- He is one of the. I've had him on this show. Yeah. He is genuinely one of the most interesting people that oh, just so cool. exist so you should definitely that. check him out um, all right well yeah. avery munson monson m-o-n-s-e-n oh, okay Monson. cool avery munson right. um, that. what do you suck at hmm dang uh what do i suck at um that's a tough one just i don't think anyone inherently sucks at something you know it's sort of like you probably suck if you're not willing to pu- push past the sucky point you know um push you know to de-suck 
but I'm not, I have a hang up about learning any kind of choreography, dancing stuff. Um, I've been doing like physical therapy for this uh, broken toe thing. And there's this one weird move I have to do called the bear crawl where I get on my hands and then I get on my toes and I, I have to do alternate hand foot forward and back. And I get so thrown off of where doing the opposite hands and then I get in my head and I, and I, I go immediate to feeling like I'm a 12 year old, you know, awkward teen, like in puberty, like I can't do this. So I, I always encounter that, that in myself. Anytime I do like any kind of choreography thing, I had to learn a dance scene for a movie. And I was just like, I have, I, I, be very patient with me because I will have moments of I will have moments of like strange panic during this thing. Um, yeah, and then I I I, uh, I what else do I suck at? I suck at um not all the time, and I only say I suck at it because it's something I'm. I try to work on, but I suck at uh, having expectations. Like a lot of times I have expectations and then when things don't go that way, it, I, it starts a whole story that I've got as to why they didn't happen. So that's something I got to trying to get out of the, get out of the sort of like program notes. What are you great at? Mm. Mm. What am I great at? Um, I am, when I get out of my own way, I am great at acting and comedy. Uh, and I only say when I get out of my own way, because I think almost all artists have internal judgments that just like, if you're thinking about it, it's going to get in your way, you know? Um, let me, I'll, I'll add, uh, I suck sometimes at getting in a state of flow, you know? Um, so, and I'm great at, uh, I want to say I'm, I'm not always great, but when I am great, I'm great at the relationships that mean the most to me. Um, it's so weird to sort of like to state these things because I think some of them going back to the permission thing is like some of these things is like, I want to give myself permission to be great. You know what I mean? Uh, so I think that maybe that's part of it. It's like, um, it, you know, as much as you like, you suck, you suck at something. If you don't push past the suck, like you're, you're only as great as you allow yourself to be. Mm, yeah. So, that's why know. I ask those questions like next to each other because it's yeah. like, oh, I suck at this, but I'm also like, I'm a multitude. I'm really good at this thing. And mm -hmm. what I like to encourage people, like some people have like a lot of problems with that question. Right. And I'm like, no, this is this is the moment to just stand on the pedestal and go, no, I, I absolutely fucking rock at, at like this specific thing. Or, right. Like, in general. Um, so I, I, I really like that kind of... Um, combo one two punch of questions because they, mm -hmm. they give a lot of good answers out of them <laughs> yeah and it's it's i would be so curious as to you know if you ask my girlfriend what i'm great at um what her answer would be if you ask my daughter she was just like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> probably being a dad yeah i hope yeah. so i hope yeah. once she yeah, yeah that's uh, her her defenses down a little bit <laughs> uh what fascinates you Oh man. Um, what fascinates me? Well, it is fascinating to me what people find funny and slash moving because I think they're very similar. They're very connected because I, I, I think of both of those and having a reaction to either something that like stirs emotion in you or stirs um, joy and laughter. It's, a, it's, it's both a release of uh, an unconscious, you know, feeling, you know what I mean? 
to me, laughter is like catching someone off guard and they're like, oh my God, you know, oh God, you know, like it is someone, someone for when people are laughing, they are willingly just like being involuntary, you know, their body takes over and hopefully they have a really goofy laugh, which is like delightful and unto itself. And then the same thing for, you know, if you're like a song catches you in the, the right way or a scene in a movie and you're, you're tearing up, like, you know, it's a gotcha moment. And I think that's a really, really great thing. So I think that's fascinating, whatever that is that does that for people. And I don't, and the, the, what's fascinating to me is like, there is, there isn't a, a thing to it. It, it, it's, it's a ser it's an insane series of just like little elements and timing and the individual, you know what I mean? And so it's the same thing for a reaction to a piece of art I love when artists are like, I don't, what's your meaning for it? Cause I don't, I made it. I know what it means to me, but you're going to have a totally different reaction. Uh, if you kind of prescribe it and saying like, Nope, this is what this is about. And if you don't have that reaction to it, then you're wrong. Um, so I guess my answer is like, I'm fascinated by what, what art does to us. What piece of media should everyone consume? What piece of media? Damn. Because I do not... I, I, I am having a sort of like... Uh, more of a hate-hate relationship with just media in general right now because I feel like we're just drowning in it. And I feel, I feel conflicted in contributing to this, you know, this garbage heap of of just like distraction you know i mean it's what to make like things like this what you're doing is is engagement i think that's that's amazing and i have to remember that in terms of like everyone's sort of reaction to us per you know particular podcast is that engagement that they might need so i think that's good um but what what piece of media should everyone consume is what you're saying right one it mm, wow it's tough to make a blanket statement for everyone. Um, this is going to be maybe dumb and I don't have a specific, but I really think everyone should at some point consume like a dumb, cute animal video and just give it up to it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just and along the same lines of like giving in to having a gotcha moment with a piece of art or laughter is like just let something cute affect you <laughs> control your senses watch a hedgehog yeah. video in particular Love yeah hedgehogs. i think i've got that for my girlfriend because she'll she'll sort of wind the day down by she watches this um sort of they'll post the feeding time at this ranch of all these like rescued animals and and it like at first I was like, oh, that's cute. And then I was like, oh, can we can we check in with Clover to go to? And it's just a, it's a really yeah, I was like, oh, okay, good. I let you move the needle for me a little bit. This is like a, you know, or just something somebody put up and you know, all these other people have engaged it. So yeah. If you could name a hot sauce, what would you call it and why? Mm. Um I'd call it Grandma TT's Gut Ripper. <laughs> uh, one, because I hopefully it would get that kind of response. And uh, I've really, I love Southern, I love Southern names for um, grandparents, Meemaw, Peepaw. Uh, so my girlfriend and I just kept you know, like, you know, TT, ting, ting, wham, wham, just whatever. Um, and I, and I do love when hot sauces sort of like promise you that it will hurt you if you, if you put on your food, like there's no joy in this. It's just, you're going to put it on. And it's more like a proving ground than anything else. So if someone comes up with the, uh, with the label art for that, I'll just concoct it myself and start to sell it online. We can go into business together. <laughs> can you make hot sauce? No, it's what, it can't be that hard. You know, <laughs> you just get a bunch of dangerous peppers and dump them into some coagulants and, uh, make sure it's red or maybe I bet hers would be black. 
I feel like hers oh, would yeah. just be hers would be like <laughs> so deep. So it's it you say like it's still red, but it's so red that it's black. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, what strange thing wait wait before you move on what what would yours be oh i see this this is the question that started this list of questions I was oh like, nice i want to know um it's my favorite question in the entire show i love it uh, and my my answer is hedgehog's kiss hedgehog's ki- hedgehog's kiss you kiss a hedgehog it's spiky so burn the yeah. yeah oh nice yeah. okay uh, and hedgehogs are my favorite animal. They're super mm-hmm. cute. Um, yeah. I have a tiny plush hedgehog at home called Hebby, who I like <laughs> say is the executive producer of this show. And usually when <laughs> I have guests on, I will show Hebby and yeah. direct your questions towards Hebby. But of course, Hebby isn't here with me at the minute. Uh, yeah. And it would be like, uh, oh, so I'm a really big fan of hot sauce. Mm-hmm. I, I have made my own hot sauce before. Oh, cool. Um, and it would it's probably, probably harder than I purported it to be you know what you'd be surprised it just takes a buttload of time yeah um but it's it's not that i made like a pineapple sauce and i used much too much pineapple in it Mm -hmm. um uh, what i've noticed is like a lot of southern hot sauces use like very thick barbecue flavors for their hot sauce or smoked flavors Mm -hmm. and smoked peppers are nice but i wanted like a sweet or a mango hot sauce gotcha and so i went for that it was nice it was like my first time but it was mm-hmm. i was proud of it um cool. the label for it would would definitely be just like a black label sauce so it'd be very upmarket it would have a hedgehog in the front foot with like a little heart except the heart would be on fire so yeah that'd be, <laughs> that's cool uh, that'd be really cool what strange thing has informed your creative work uh i mean i'm trying to i don't know why but I immediately pictured my room when I was in high school and I, my daughter's going through the same phase, which I was like, Oh man, this makes me so happy that she's doing this thing. And that this is, I guess, something that, you know, all teenagers do, but it was that thing where you just, your walls become your, your like, 3d vomiting of everything that's kind of been influencing you or like that you're excited about and stuff and so she she is doing things that i did in a similar way of just like i would i literally found like a, a piece of shag carpeting on the street and hung it on my wall and then i dragged in like a concrete base to a um, bird bath and put it in my room and my, my dad was always like, why are you putting this crap in your room? I was like, because I want it to be here. And, you know, so she's like hanging up things that you wouldn't hang on your wall, uh, uh, doilies and um, like receipts from the grocery stores from like visits we've done. So it's just like tons of stuff. Um, so that makes me think of, so there's that strangeness to that I, I that I, again it maybe goes back to that permission thing i was like i don't care like this this i love i love this like i i love that this is weird like i love permission to be weird um and then when i was in high school i had a really good art teacher turn me on to um robert rauschenberg do you know that painter um he was in the same period uh uh as jasper johns and it was pre-pop uh art and it was uh it was sort of like i'm not sure it was abstract art but it was sort of like deconstruction and stuff so he would take he'd have a a frame um and he would sort of like put a part of a chair coming out of the frame and paint over it and a lot of like splattered paint and it just looked it kind you know at the time it was like this is insane and now it kind of like oh yeah i've seen this in like kind of crappy local coffee shops where somebody's just like i don't know why but i put this part of a poem on this you know in 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 the middle of this paint and stuff so and i say that like i'm judging it which i am a little bit but it's like that they wouldn't have that reference unless someone made the reference first and did the did the work so as with like all art at you know 20 years later you're like understanding the context of it and stuff i was like oh i love that that you know and i think the other thing i love what strange thing is 
Um, uh, it's it's that adults were doing this. You know what I mean? Like 25 plus or 35 year old, you know, middle middle class white guys were sort of like giving it all up and moving to New York and living in a loft and and doing something that you know objectively is kind of like oh you're just making a mess every day and <laughs> and trying to sell that mess um but I I love that you know I think that's really great so I guess my strange thing is that piece of shag carpet that I hung up on my wall <laughs> That's really cool. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, my, this ties into my answer for the next question. Uh -huh. But the, the definitely the strangest thing, and this is kind of cheating because it's a pun. Mm. The strangest thing that has informed my creative work, specifically this show, is Weird Al. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Weird Al has been like this strange background character in mm. my life. Um, where... I the the visual nature of like Weird Al is almost like you're so weird and I there's something earnest about that and right. it's like that has nothing to do with interviewing right there's not mm -hmm. nothing in Weird Al's discography would be right. like yeah this engenders me toward interviewing people but it's like oh no there's just an earnestness about this this song that's about fucking viruses from the early 2000s yeah that, like i should bring that to my to, to like he's like if i was to list off like my creative influences for this show I'd be like bah, bah, yeah. bah, bah, and then i'd have to stop and go oh yeah and weird al's on there too and you're like right huh um yeah and that that is definitely strange because like the, the, it's genre mixing first of all mm -hmm. but also like i could not be the the creative i am today without listening over and over and over again to Weird Al's music and being mm -hmm. like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And I like that a lot. Um, so the next question then is like, who is at your ideal poker game? Oh, these ones honestly give me a little bit of, I'm always like, oh no. Well, the weird thing is like, I... I do prescribe to the thing of like, never meet your heroes. So when I sort of like a, you know, asked or asked to serve a simpler group, I was like, ah, but they're all, I bet most of them will be assholes and I don't want to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, it would be, um, man, this is a tough one. Uh, well, there's this outsider artist named Henry Darger um, that I just would be curious to hear him, what his mouth would say. Um, <laughs> um, I think Buddha should be there, you know? It'd be nice to, to, because I imagine he would be kind of practical and, it, you know, he would say things that are like, didn't seem that profound. And then later on, you're like, oh my God um who else poker is like you need at least four right for it to yes really, yeah. yeah um so you're included so you kind of like yeah i'm terrible at poker too i've been kicked out of poker games because they're just like <laughs> you gotta go man you don't know what you're doing uh so there's gotta be some someone who's gonna have my back there um i want a musician there who do i want um I want, uh, gosh, this, I mean, this is really one of those ones where I'm like, Oh God. I mean, the podcast might end up being a, a like a two hour interview with just a lot of stammering, but you know, um, no, who, okay. So I want to say Lou Reed, but I don't think he would be fun to hang out with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's do Mo Tucker from the from the Velvet Underground. Um, oh yeah, that's a, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I think she would be cool. Uh, and then I like I want to have someone. I want to have a comedian there. Um, 
but I want it to be someone I have d- I don't know much about. I would say uh, Sid Caesar. Um, he is a 1950s um, comedian. He had this show called Your Show of Shows that a lot of like amazing future comedian people like Rob Reiner and before he was a piece of shit, Woody Allen and um, uh, who else? Mel Brooks all wrote for. Um, yeah, I think it would just be interesting to sort of, especially to get someone from, from the fifties, uh, see what would come out of their mouth. Um, let me throw one, one more person in there. Let's get, um, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Just, I'm curious. I'm just curious. Who do you think would win? Uh, oh, probably Buddha. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Enlightenment, <laughs> connected to everything, knows everyone's yeah. hand. He would just accept the hand he has and just graciously fold when he needed to and just sort of observe others. And then next thing you know, he's sort of like, oh, I'm all in. Oh, that's great. I won. So my poker game is trying to get, like, the people that I, I know would have, like, a weird conversation. Not necessarily, mm-hmm. like, a good conversation, but definitely a weird one. Right. So Jonathan Frakes... Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation <laughs> uh, because in the show it's a notable thing that like Riker is amazing at poker and I would just mm-hmm. be fascinated to see if that translates to real life he also just seems like the war- like a warm bubbly human being so I'm like right. okay you definitely are here mm-hmm. Weird Al because the interaction between those two would be the most hilarious thing I've ever seen in my entire life I yeah. think they would get on like a house on fire um, but I don't think that like it would be a strange conversation, certainly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I would probably put like Kurt Cobain mm, at the table. That's good one. Yeah, um, just because I think that there is something, there's something a little bit that I relate to a little bit about Kurt Cobain, like a lot about Kurt Cobain because I love Kurt Cobain's music. But like, there's mm-hmm. something that I. I think that he would bring a certain somberness, but also madness to the table. It's also interesting the idea of like what what time period these people would be. You know what I mean? Like Kurt Cobain right at the end would be a very different Kurt Cobain than maybe j- just after they recorded Nevermind or just in the process of recording that or something. I think maybe that's a good question. That's like a good stipulation. Probably um, just on on the tour of Nevermind before mm-hmm. he got like sick of playing all of his music. <laughs> yeah. Um, that there at that exact moment, just after Dave Grohl like really got settled into the band and mm-hmm. everything was like peak Nirvana because they were going right. to record like three more. Um, then uh, uh, that would be Jonathan Frakes modern day. Uh, Weird Al Modern Day. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably uh, Mencius. Mencius is a uh, Chinese philosopher. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is a, from the Confucian school. I think it would be really cool because I don't want Confucius there because Confucius is notoriously obtuse. And yep. Mencius, I think Mencius would be absolutely incredible at um, right. at, at poker. Uh, and then uh, Mary McAleese. Mary McAleese was a uh, female president of Ireland. Wow. She's still, yeah, she's still alive. Yeah. Uh, and I just think she'd wipe floor. <laughs> she'd yeah, totally. Um, so, yeah, if I had one more person, like, give it, like, another, maybe, like, an actor or a comedian, Samuel L. Jackson. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's I think cool. that would be a really interesting group of people just to watch. Yes. Um, I think I would completely get destroyed in poker totally well you and you already picked uh Minchus would be the winner right oh, yeah, it's always yeah. it's always the people the philosophers or the, the enlightened ones who are gonna yeah clean up Minchus is like notorious for being like very direct and like calling people out mm-hmm. uh so that's why i think you like if i you know you don't you don't have that in your hand your hand's bullshit i'm gonna move on i think you would fold when he needs to as well do you say i love you too much or too little i i know you don't give me the choice i feel like i i do it the right amount you know i hope 
I hope so. I it's funny. Uh, a friend of mine, a uh, comedian, and another comedian they had they they bonded over the fact that their dad said "I love you" too much to them. You know what I mean? And and I know that they were sort of they bonded over that at that time in their life. It's just like okay, I get it. And sometimes I. You know, if it and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, it's like uh, my expectations or like I need you to have a reaction for me to sort of like feel okay with what I just did. I, I'm now in a place where like if I say I love you to my daughter, sometimes she's not going to say it back. Um, and and <clears throat> I will say around divorce time that was very terrifying to me you know what i mean like, i was like oh my god uh, it, the contract is broken and you know the house <laughs> you did all this kind of stuff um but now i'm just like yeah i say it i say it as a reminder i say it as a goodbye i say it as a i say it to my girlfriend just you know whenever it hits me which is good um yeah i, I have a pretty good relationship with saying i love you a very interesting phrasing there where you said like the contract is broken like the unspoken yeah. contract yeah yeah, yeah. That's i know tough that's a rough I know. one <laughs> i know right yeah and i think it's like that's yeah it's like there's not con the contract evolves the contract changes and, and also it's not a contract <laughs> certainly a contract implies like you're bound by it Mm -hmm. and you're not like the only thing you're bound by in life is like the desire to make you and the people you love happy that's right pretty much it like everything yeah. else is extraneous it, like it obviously gets more complicated but that's kind of my go-to yeah yeah i had a tough i had a weird relationship with that like i i could say it to my mom and my sister but when my mom remarried um I was told to tell my stepdad, he adopted us and I pretty much grew up with him, but I was told to tell him that I loved him. And I was like, well, I don't know if I do, you know? Yeah, it has to so be that, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, in those, as far as like saying this, like that uh, the contract is broken, I think the back of my mind, there's a little bit of this thing of like, I don't want, I don't want anyone in my life to sort of feel like um i said it to you so you have to say it back um you know what i mean or um uh or the saying of it it initiates a feeling of discomfort or a lie or something because i've definitely and I, I admit to like being in relationships where i was like i've you know, you've told the other person you love them. You're like, ah, I don't love them, but we started that part. So my girlfriend and I, we didn't like agree to like, you know, I can't say this and stuff, but we were, we had shared with one another that we we're, you know, past for like a couple of relationships. We're like, yeah, we were sort of like getting into territory where we weren't being honest. It was just like, I really love being with you, you know, or, you know, just like this relationship is, is not something deeper and that's okay. Um, but we, and it was probably about, and I was also really wary of sort of rushing into something and being like, I have all these feelings because it's exciting and stuff. So it was probably about four months in. And I remember like, just from the beginning, I was like, I think I love this person, but I, I'm just going to be, careful about this but i really am i love this person and so we were getting ready to go somewhere and she's about to meet some friends of mine for the first time and she was like do i look okay da, da, da. and i was like I, you look great i mean it doesn't matter i love you and she's like what i was like um and she's like did you just say i, I love you i was like i think i did <laughs> and and then she said it back and it, it was great it was like a really really great moment but then I, but then I had also let it slip a couple of other times in that involuntary way. Um, and each time I was like, I hope she didn't hear that. I kind of hope she did, but I kind of hope she didn't because I don't want to scare her off. What is the most valuable thing you have ever learned? I guess the most valuable thing I've ever learned is the past is not the present and it doesn't have to be the future. I think that's it. I think it's like, I have... I've held on to a lot of past things that I have assigned to a present existence and then fearfully uh, worried that would be part of a future. And the more I kind of just like 
let go of that stuff, the the more present I am. So I guess the other the other version of that answer is like um, ex- acceptance of of what is now is really the only option you've or the best option you've got. How do you feel about death? Oh, that's a good one. I um I feel okay about it. Uh I both my parents are dead. They died my all three, I mean I'll say all, all three of my parents because I my biological father died when I was 28 and then no, 26 and then my dad died my the dad that adopted me and I grew up with died when I was 28 and then my mom died with when I was 30 so every two years <laughs> somebody was going so for a long time yeah death was just like an annual event that seemed to be happening in my life and I was just it it rocked my world um and this past year my girlfriend's mother passed away and so I've been with her on that journey um journey and 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 I would say from what I went through with that experience and then what my girlfriend's going through now, I've gotten to a place where I'm like, it is, it is one of those things like it, it, it happens to every single thing, plant, animal, human. Um, and we have a very dysfunctional relationship with it if we see it as something to be inherently fearful of or preemptively regretful about um so i've actually thought you know during my my girlfriend's experience i i have sort of pictured what it would it might be like for the people in my life if i said like i'm dying um and how i would i would want to somehow communicate to them that it's okay, that they'll be okay, that yes, it's sad. Um, But I think, yeah, I just think it's like, I don't think there's like a great meaning to it. Like if you die young, does that imply something? No, that's just the occurrence of it. And I'm not saying, I also don't think that, you know, when you die, um, that it doesn't have meaning, you know, I just think that I personally think we're here in this version of what existence is. And then we go to another version of what existence is. And in only in the past kind of couple of years that I've been like, I kind of am excited about what the next version is. <laughs> Not that I want to get there sooner than I, you know, should, um, or, or anything like that but i'm just like okay yeah i i i I, there there's such power in saying like i don't know i do not know um and i don't think honestly even us trying to sort of put a framework or a definition about what might be is possible i just don't think our brains are in this iteration in this plane of existence um capable of it so just be kind of open-hearted or open-minded to another version that might happen i have said this on the show before but i want to tell you the thing that like really changed my perception of it where so i visited uh the vatican uh with my college as part of a one of the modules i was doing it was the study of rome uh, Rome ancient and Baroque it's a really incredible experience I got to go to like behind the scenes areas because like my, one of my professors was like very well known and very well respected so we were just like led into places and we got to go into the Vatican catacombs and they were showing us through underneath the Vatican the Vatican is built on an ancient like strip of mausoleums uh, and and you just are walking through these like very narrow corridors and on each side there's these buildings which were like christian temples or roman temples 
and we stop in front of this one in this very dank, dank and dark room with like a flickering light overhead and there's a stairs going up the side of it like of this like squat building and the inside is like all gold and uh, has like filigree and inside is written the name of the person and there's a but there's a stairs and mm-hmm. i was like what they don't need stairs mm-hmm. and i was like oh maybe it's room. something <laughs> maybe it's something to do with um like uh metaphysically ascending or something walking upwards mm-hmm. towards god and my professor turns to me and he goes no this is people used to come here when they were sad about their father passing away they used to go up top and drink lemonade there's a lemon squeezer up the top like the equivalent of you know like lemon juice and stuff and orange juice uh and they used to just sit there and they used to talk to the person that's in this building even though they were gone they weren't gone for them so like they had a belief of the afterlife and stuff and even for the christian muslims but they would go to this place and they would go oh yeah how are you doing uh, how are you feeling? How is being dead? Um, and that's what I really don't like about cemeteries. Because there's nowhere to sit down. Uh, there's nowhere to be like, sit near a grave and be like, hey, how, how's it going? I don't know. I thought that for me was very beautiful because like, death is incomprehensible. And like, we we become something different and as you said it could be transitioned to a different plane or it could be just i turn into grass and trees and wind and that is incomprehensible to my brain but the idea that like people won't be sad um (laughs) because they can just talk to me anytime they like um and that's really nice now i am a little bit devious right a little bit devious in that when i changed my name i wanted to get a headstone with my old name on it and put it in my garden. And my my dad said, don't do that. It'll make your mom very upset. I was like, yeah, but I want to, it's funny. <laughs> um, but I started this show feeling terrified about death. And this many episodes in, after asking that question a bunch, I feel calm or confident even, it's like a friend. Uh, Cause it's never, it's never not going to be there. So, like, you always have a companion. And it's a weird companion and a cold companion and an unforgiving one. But it's always there. I'm like, how are you doing today, Death? Uh, good to get some variety in my routine. It is strange <laughs> that I've said it. I've heard my girlfriend say it. Others have said it. You know, it's just like, it, it is that simple phrase. Like, I can't believe they're just gone. You know what I mean? That part of it, as far as, like, wrapping your head around the idea of like, what is a person? What is, what is existence and stuff? I, the, you know, this, this time around with, with my sort of proximity to death, I definitely had that feeling of like, we are, our bodies are, you know, they are delivery systems for a spirit or a soul. Um, And that you know, it's like a car and eventually your car breaks down. Um, and then the people who's transporting have to find another mode of transportation or something, but yeah, but it's, but that part, that is, a, that is, I think that's one of the hardest things of just like the, a reality that you knew and a consistency or a constant to the narrative of your life suddenly is missing a character or missing an element or is missing some something you depended on. Um, and I think that that that's where people really get thrown off, you know, and it's it's completely understandable. And it's and it's just and it 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 requires a, an integration. It's just like it's just like this is you have to integrate the lack of that person into your life and the definition of who that person was you have to integrate into your presence you know so that's a weird i think that's a weird thing of like it is it is a collision it becomes like this huge collision between past and present um and like i was saying like past present and future like i know what my past was i hate this present what's the future going to be like without this person um and that 
that's up to you, I think. How's your week going? Uh, my week's going really well, actually. Um, not nothing phenomenal happening. Um, just feeling like even keeled and, and grateful and, and present. Uh, so I, I'd say that I was like, I'm not feeling like overwhelmed. I'm not sort of like, um, not bored, which is good being bored for me is like, I think I'm learning a lot about anxiety just on the other side of pandemic stuff. Cause I think it kicked up a lot of anxiety for me. And, um, I think boredom for me feels like inactivity, which feels like, uh, being locked, you know, being stuck. And then that brings up my anxiety and stuff. So, you know, that's my very uh, open therapeutic <laughs> response to your question. Uh, yeah, it's good. What question do you wish you were asked? I guess I wished I was asked. Um, so now I'm trying to think what question I would ask someone. Um, uh, definitely do not cut out this long pause. <laughs> That's everyone's favorite part. Is I know. Oh my God. It's so hard. Um, I guess I wish I was asked, um, what am I most proud of? Oh, that is actually the next question. Well, then I, okay. Let's go back to that original one. I am great at predicting interview questions. <laughs> just, just so you don't think I'm like bullshitting you. Yeah. It's right there. What do you, nice. What do you think you're most proud of? Yeah. There you go. All right. Um, <laughs> what are you most proud of? Uh, I am most proud that I uh, became a comedian and an actor and fulfilled an honest dream that I had for myself since I was in second grade, but took a long time to get to. Another thing I'm very proud of is the special I did, two specials I did for Adult Swim called Mr. Neighbor's House, Mr. Neighbor's House 2. And you can watch them on the Adult Swim website, which is enormously difficult to navigate. Good luck. And then also, but you can find the link in my social media um, handles, which on Twitter and Instagram are the Brian Husky. And it's also on YouTube. So it's Mr. Neighbor's House, Mr. Neighbor's House 2. If you were on a starship, what position would you hold? I feel like I would be, uh, I, I would, I'd take a position as the therapist, the sort of counselor. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like that that's something that's wildly overlooked in all of these series. Like if you're going on, like if you're stuck in a, a spaceship that it's probably going to be gone for like what, 10 years or something, people are going to lose their minds and they're going to need somebody to talk to. So and it can't have a religious affiliation, so it would have to be some kind of like counselor. If you could give just one piece of advice, what would that be? My one piece of advice would be, um, it kind of goes back to what, something interesting that you said. It's like, you, you're not going to remember all the negative as much as the positive. I think I spent a lot of my life remembering the negative, and not being open to the positive. So I guess my piece of advice is like, forget the negative, look for the positive. <laughs>